Okay, Elise, are you ready? Yes, I've got my ready? hand. I'm ready to go. Okay, so um, this is a two-fold question. Does this mean I have to remember something? You'll help me. Go ahead. You, you can make it up if you don't. Okay, so who would you... Okay, well, let me see if I should put this in order. Okay, no. Who would you most like to... Um, visit Nashville for the Salon 615 series and what guest has inspired you the most? Well, Roy's already been here. <laughs> That's an appropriate answer right there. Good job. I'm, I'm okay. So I understand that Barack Obama was doing, he was going to be doing some virtual events. Mm. Sure would like to have him come. Um, Barack, if you're watching, He's Brock to Nashville. Come on, hi Brock. Hi Brock. Yeah. What was the second question? The influence? I don't know what the yeah. question, is, but the answer is Gloria Steinem. There you go. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> after, Whatever the question. After Roy, it was Gloria Steinem. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> this is what '79 looked like. <laughs> You're looking damn good, Roy. You're looking better. Um, but Gloria Steinem, you were there, both of you, yeah. right? Oh yeah, it was yeah. fantastic. Well, I, mean, I don't know if you guys were there, but um, that was that was a momentous occasion for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in every way. I so, wish you could have moderated it. I'm just gonna say that. Well, in hindsight, <laughs> I mean that was a that was a daunting task. Um, and they were friends, and well, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, um, I found that to be one of the things that she said that stuck with me. Let me see if I can get the, there's a, there's a, there's a difference between the past and history and one is written, one isn't. And, and we talk about one, we don't talk about the other. And I found that to be profound and, um, she was talking obviously about women's rights, but as she said, it ap applies to any um, any kind of civil rights situation. The past isn't documented. History is documented. And there's a lot of things in the past we don't know about. And I was there with my favorite feminist, B.G. Adair, so that was even better. Yeah. Back in the 60s, we all were getting into all of that. And, um as you get older, you everything mellows out a little bit, but I'm well, still, there, you, you know. You can, except for that you can't. It can't. But you can't, right. There's so still issues every day, right, in our faces. So, oh, yeah. You know. And some of them are getting worse than they were. Yeah. You're taking a few steps backwards in a lot of different ways, not just for women, but. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting in the next few months with. Supreme Court decisions and things that are going to directly affect a lot of people, mm -hmm. all of us in some way or another, I guess. Yeah. Um, okay, so Gloria Steinem and Barack Obama, want, we need you. We need you to come to Nashville. Please come to We me. really do. <laughs> we really do. We had, um, we had Barack Obama on wait, wait. Don't tell me. Um, before he was president, he was a senator. Mm -hmm. And he said uh, that he, uh, when he showed up at the Senate the first time, he uh, every, saw that every senator had a little desk, like at school, a little wooden desk. And, uh, and he saw, to his astonishment, that senators over the centuries had carved their names into, the, uh, um, into their desks. And, and I said, are you supposed to do that? And he <laughs> said, uh, now I've forgotten what he said. He said, uh, oh, I know. He said, as the only uh, African-American senator, I thought I might spray paint my name. <laughs> <laughs> and then graffiti it. There yeah. you go. Oh, my. That's funny. I like it. <laughs> um, um, okay, so BG, are you ready to have a beverage? Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to refresh BG's beverage while I ask Ernie, um, after I ask Ernie this question. Um, are you ready, Ernie? Are you Burn, ready? Bring it. Okay. <clears throat> Ernie, 
Ernie Reynolds, arborist, dog lover, business owner, writer. Who is the most underrated writer of Southern culture and experiences? I'm leaving now. I'm my first blush is to say uh, Brees DJ Pancake. Um, with honorable mention to Larry Brown, Harry Cruz, and William Gay. Um, <clears throat> Pancake was born in the 50s and died by suicide at age 27, similar to Mike Williams, uh, but he was a short fiction writer uh, who wrote uh, a total of 12 stories, all published now, six published in the Atlantic before his passing. Um, West Virginian, uh, an MA, if I recall correctly, at the University of Virginia, a high school teacher, and eventually a, a, um, a, a collegiate uh, instructor. But he had his thumb on what it was like to be a, 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 an impoverished uh, Southern male uh, in that period of the of the '60s and early '70s, kind of that that lost cause era, uh, and so I would nominate him first. Do you know him, Roy? No, I know. I mean, I know who he is. Certainly, I know, and I read some of his stories, and I like him very much. But I never met him. Um, when did he die? Oh boy, uh, seventy-eight, if I recall. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's just back away, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's been gone a while. Yeah. Was that his real name? Yeah, Brees Pancake is his real name. When he uh, the his first uh, publication in the Atlantic, they misprinted his name as Brees DJ Pancake. So he oh, stayed. Well, I wondered. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. I love Harry Cruz. Me too, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gone but not forgotten. Yeah. Where, where in West Virginia was Pancake from? I don't know. I don't know. I know he was, it was rural and it was mountainous. I was born in West Virginia. I'm sorry, John. So I was born in West Virginia, so I just wanted oh, okay. to You were? Yeah, I thought you moved from Kentucky. Yeah. I, well, I, we moved to Kentucky when I was seven. Oh, okay. Oh. I grew up in Kentucky. That too. Hmm. <laughs> Frankfurt. No, so that's not, not, not Frankfurt. Not Frankfurt. Uh, yeah, Frankfurt. But yeah. that was uh, we lived in Eastern Kentucky for several years, then moved to Frankfurt. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> if we make a question, ask Roy a question now. Yeah, of course. Roy. Yeah. I would like to ask you a thousand questions. I'm going to limit oh. myself to one. You know, listen, this is a happy hour. Do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I'm oh. just trying to keep the pace. And get out of the way. When you, when you were, did you kind of embed yourself with the with the Steelers? Yeah. In the seventies. Yeah, they, uh, the seventy three season. Uh, I was at Sports Illustrated then, and the editor of Sports Illustrated wanted somebody to. Uh, Spend a year with a an NFL team, and uh, uh, at, at a liquid lunch, he uh, worked up this notion and called me in. And <laughs> I was uh, divorced at the time, and uh, so. Uh, I, but I picked the Steelers because I had been I had watched them. Uh, I loved Pittsburgh for one thing. I loved the Pirates, and um, the, uh, Pirates were a really funny team back then in the seventies. And um, I, I knew that um, the Steelers were, you know, that Art Rooney lived walking distance from the stadium, and uh, and, and that there were everywhere you went in Pittsburgh, there were there were colorful characters, and I just thought it'd be the perfect team. So they w really wanted me to do the Giants or the Rams or some, you know, big city team, but I held out for the Steelers, and I showed up at. Uh, uh, 
at uh, practice, what, what do you, not spring training, what do you call it, Fall, uh, uh, training camp. Training camp. And, yeah, and um, just told everybody I was there to write a book. And they, they had not been, they hadn't gotten all that much attention yet. And so they were, they welcomed me in, in and uh, took me out and we drank a, lot, a whole lot of beer every evening. And, uh, and I just sort of moved in. Uh, and I had a great time, really. Uh, it was always, they, they had just wonderful characters. Frenchie Fuqua, who mm -hmm. uh, was on uh, the... Rocky, uh, Rocky yeah, Rocky Blyer. Rocky Blyer had this great... Uh, he, he, he did a great uh, impression of a rooster. He was strutting around. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really do it, but... Uh, he, oh, um, my goodness. <laughs> Did you, you saw the emergence of, of Nashville's uh, Jefferson Street Joe Gilliam? Yeah, the, he, oh, he, uh, Joe Gilliam. yeah, Joe Gilliam. He uh, was the starting quarterback the year after I was with him for a while, and then he got it, uh, and he was really looked like he was going to take over. But then I don't. It's a, it's a deep thing, but he. He had substance abuse problems that, uh, that ended his career with the Steelers. And, uh, it was a shame because he had enormous talent. And uh, uh, he could throw, they said that he was the best. Uh, he, th the, he threw the best pass to catch uh, of any of the court. They had Terry Ann Raddy and Brad, uh, Terry Bradshaw. But uh, Jefferson Street Joe was uh, – he, he was still full of uh, – Full of uh, life and loved playing and uh, loved just filling the air with long forward passes. And uh, I was really rooting for him, even though I liked Bradshaw and, and Henry. Henry was one of my best friends on the team. But uh, but Joe was, uh, he, he told a story about um, some team, uh, some Nashville team beat, uh, what, 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 uh, what national team did he play for? TSU, Tennessee State University. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that was in college. And somebody, his father was a coach. That's and, right. And uh, he said some uh, some other team beat, beat them. And, no, the other team fired his father. Because he was coaching, uh, his father was coaching uh, for the other team for some reason. And uh, But then they played, uh, Joe's team played that team. He, and uh, he said uh, he just uh, he beat, beat the other team 45 to nothing or something and uh, said, fire my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he, he was quite a character. And there's, a, you know, a whole sorts of racial considerations and people, uh, uh, the Steelers were always pretty good about uh uh, at least the Steelers, uh, beginning there in the seventies, were pretty good about race relations, and went on to be the you know there's the Dan Rooney rule now in the NFL that every team has to at least interview a, an African American candidate for a head coaching job. Uh, so they were, they, you know, I, I didn't want to be too easy on them about race, but uh, I don't think they. Uh, I think they were willing to have Joe be the starting quarterback, but he was just, he was erratic, but he sure was fun to watch. He was. Somebody's very popular on this. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm very popular. Are you on call? No, no, this, this is Carol's computer. It's going crazy. I don't know how to turn it on. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad it's you. I kept wondering who's pissed off at me. <laughs> it's Carol, not me. <laughs> Wait, where is Carol? Is she going to make an appearance? We're well, going to get to I, see her again. Yeah, she, first of all, she she can't uh, spend the money uh, Monday without watching Tamara Keith and, uh, and what's her name on on in, on PBS, and she, she yeah. went back to watch that, and now she's still downstairs. I don't know what she's doing. Okay, well, if she would like to join us, just let her know that we would love to see her. I'll tell her. We'd love to see her face. Yeah. This, um, by the way, is over here is my wife's painting. My wife, Joan. This little product. Oh. As long as we're talking about our wives. Yeah. Wait, can you can you, can you you zoom in a little bit? Can you move your camera? I, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, don't do anything. And I have, I have two of her paintings in my house. But That's right. 
I, I'm not going to go downstairs and walk around with them, but they're beautiful paintings. <laughs> Well, John, oh, did, did your she show, you um, what's that? Did she show at a gallery, or how can we see yeah, she, uh, her things? She doesn't have a gallery in Nashville anymore, but she uh, has one in uh, Nantucket and uh, one mm -hmm. in New Orleans, and then she's got a she's online, uh, JoanGrizzle.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you say that well, one more time? Say it again. Joan Griswold. Is her name Joan Griswold? G R I S W O L D. Okay, and we will we'll put that in the description. Yeah, oh, if you're right. watching, you can go to that link and buy up all of her work quickly. Right. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's more it's right. more valuable right now than it was 30 seconds ago because we talked about <laughs> there you it. Go. There you go. It looks wonderful. It's true. Oh, Elise is an artist. Ah, hey, yeah, all right. So, all right, yeah. tell us, tell us. You, yeah, go on. Your turn. Go on. Your turn. No, I certainly collect it. I don't know that I am one, but you yeah, I appreciate I it. Have, you know? I have your I have your artwork on my wall. So why don't you tell us about the artwork that you produce for people? It's been a while. I did the photography. I don't know what you have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like kind of about that. Or I did, yeah. And yeah, I I did that to keep myself out of. <laughs> out of trouble, out of jail for many, many years, and it was wonderful. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to know you have one, Monica. I do. You gave it to me. It's for my. It was a birthday present. It was my thirtieth birthday present. Really? Love it. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. Good I'm job. Happy. Well, thank you. Yeah, because it's been it's been a few minutes since I did any photography, so that makes me well. Happy. I know that it's going to be difficult for you to have time when you start your new very important gig other important gig because what she does with the library now is extremely important and i want to talk about that actually i kind of bypassed that it's okay but uh, anyway you should paint on your free time i know you've been baking and you said the other night on a personal happy hour that you're not baking anymore so maybe you should just go back to photography and painting and all that stuff maybe or i'm going to take up another instrument i thought about that too I got my guitar out. That's what my computer is sitting on right this minute. You know, I started playing the piano again and my guitar, and I'm really thinking about the mandolin, so we'll see. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Because <laughs> baking, I gained 300 pounds. I can't keep baking. Yeah. Are you... Uh, I, ha I have lots of other questions. L look, I have so many questions. <laughs> but um, yeah. tell us about what you're doing with Parnassus when you transition yeah so the director of events i mean first of all i think all of you here know about parnassus and it's co-owned uh ann patrick the author and karen hayes and here in nashville independent bookstore and for those people in nashville that remember when davis kid closed oh and yeah. we were without a bookstore and and then Karen and Anne opened up Parnassus and the angels were singing and we were kind of right once more. And, um, you know, it's really important for me just personally to do what I believe in. And the library career has been incredible. There's nothing, no institution like the public library. And, you know, in retirement, it would take something pretty significant to get me out of my sleep, which I had planned on doing upon retirement. Um, and so this job with Parnassus, which is just, you know, an independent bookstore that I believe in all independent bookstores, as I believe in all small businesses that really, you know, are part of the fabric of any community. Um, it would take something like that to, to get me kind of out of retirement again. And the programs and the authors and all the incredible things they do aside from book selling um, yeah. they, they bring they enhance it they kind of amplify the literary scene by three to four hundred programs a year That's so i'll be very busy uh, yeah. and just hosting different authors and just other events and I, I'll keep you posted. Hmm. My connection right now has been kind of on the library side of the salons sure. and 
um, now I will be kind of overseeing all of the events and it's all different now. It's kind of like we are here, right? Everything is, they're continuing, we're continuing to do it, only we're doing it in a virtual environment. And I just, I encourage people to really remember to, you know, think about your local stores, think about the independence. I mean, all these big corporations, they're making money right now. But yeah. I think really um, in a small local business and in an independent store, you are not a piece of data. You're actually a human being and it's becoming more and more <laughs> important these days. Well, you know, there is something and we hear this a lot about people saying it's the face, it's the conversation. It's to be able to make a phone call and to have somebody answer your call or to answer your questions or, you know, whatever. And that really matters. And I know that the library, we've talked about this, they have adapted beautifully mm -hmm. to um, the current situation so people can still be active with the library, but safe. And I'm assuming, I know Parnassus is doing the same thing. They have curbside pickup for books. They you know, you can order online. There's all these things. And bookstores across the country like that. They're, right. you know, they're all adapting. We're playing, you know, it's so great because all libraries, we all play so well together. And then learning more and more about Parnassus, mm -hmm. that a lot of times authors are having these virtual events and then the bookstores are all working together yeah. and yeah. partnering together. Who does that? You know, it's so really, cool. yeah, it's wonderful. So there's virtual, there's curbside. So there's really, I think in both of the, you know, the both places, um, there's, it's all about the patron, customer. It's all about the people. Completely. So, well, this next question kind of is a nice segue for anyone who wants to answer. It was not geared to an individual. Um, I'm going to add my own little two cents on the end of it. What books are you reading now that you can buy from Parnassus <laughs> or check out from the library? How about that? So anyone they want to know, folks want to know what you, what are you all reading? What's going on in your world? I'll start out with that. And thank you for everything that you do, Elise. That's awesome and, and enormously important. I, I am. I'm just starting in uh, Larry Brown's uh, Tiny Love, and I am rereading uh, Milton's Paradise Lost right now, which I'm sure I could both find. I find at least one of those on the shelf and order order the other at Parnassus and both at the library. I'm reading a book that my granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter, who's uh, 16, wanted me to read. Uh, it's called. Um, this could be your future by Yancey. Somebody, it's a very interesting book. He's the person who started Kickstarter, and it's about really getting away from this idea that the most important thing in life is making lots of money, but but it's actually creating an environment of doing good things. It's, it's a wonderful book. Great. I'm looking up who wrote it. You said Yancey. Yancey's his first name. Yeah. Strickler. Strickler. Yeah. Strickler. Yeah. Roy, what are you reading? I'm just picked up reading, um, now I can't remember the author's name at all, but it's called uh, The Saddest Words, Faulkner's Civil War. It's about, um, it's a sort of looking at Faulkner now in, in light of, of everything. Um, you know, so the fresh look at Faulkner by a, a man who teaches at Smith College. I don't know. I'm Michael sure. Gora. Yeah, Michael Gora, yeah. It, it, or is it Michael Gore? Oh, I guess so. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, it's good. I just started reading. I just picked it up yesterday for my birthday, uh, Joan. And, and it's, um, I don't know, it's, you know, Faulkner is, um, wrote about all kinds of, you know, wrote about slavery and all sorts of stuff that uh, uh, lots of people, you know, lots of people, what they wrote about slavery and all kinds of stuff doesn't hold up too well. But, the, but, uh, uh, this uh, scholar uh, uh, appreciates Faulkner for uh, for how he's to the extent to which he holds up and also gets uh, uh, you know looks at him from a fresh perspective. The saddest words, by the way, are "was," uh, which is you know something that "was" is over now. You can't do anything about it. Or you can't. Uh, 
can't change it. It was. And the other one, the saddest though, is again. That was, hmm. Start doing the was thing again. It's even worse. Oh. Wow. That's deep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Wow. Um, so okay. I have a million books. BG, what are you, what are you reading? Right now I'm plowing through and I'm, I, I do mean plowing through big book. Um, it's called Separated, an American Tragedy. And it's a um, um, journalist from MSNBC, uh, Jacob Uberoff, I think his name is. Um, it's a day by day, blow by blow, history and up into the present of the children that are imprisoned and away from their families in the Southwest. Mm. And the way he had, has done his research, it goes way back before we even knew this was going on. And it was going on right from the get-go after the election. And it was just covered up. And they did things like they did not identify the children. They gave them a number. And then one of the guys that was in charge of the ICE thing uh, was caught throwing the identification numbers away so they wouldn't have to worry about getting a kid back to his parents. Oh. And they have dug tunnels and um, just all kinds of stuff. The kids have? The children dug the tunnels? No. They, they've dug tunnels and put more places for children to be imprisoned. Oh, wow. and, um, and it's a lot about the, um, the wall that's being built. And they're constantly having people go over, the, like Roger says, if you build a 10-foot wall, I'll show you an 11-foot ladder. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and if people are so... Um, scared because they're coming from Guatemala and places where the gangs are rampant. Um, if they're scared enough to try to come here, they will find ways to do it and get over the wall. What's, what's the name of it? Did you what's the name? Step, it, it's called Separated. Separate. Separated and American Tragedy. Um, it's a big one. I'm, I'm about halfway no through it. <laughs> Jacob Soboroff. Soboroff, yeah. Um, and he comes on occasionally on MSNBC. He travels most of the time. But he will bring updates sometimes in person uh, on that channel. And it's, he, I think he's going to get a Pulitzer. I hope he is. But the research is unbelievable. It's like just detail, detail, detail about how this came about. And basically it was going to be covered up. Completely. Yeah. Mm. So uh, it's, uh, I have to read a little bit at a time and then put it down and read jazz anecdotes <laughs> or something just yeah. to get out of that area in my and head. Andy Griffith. Hmm? Sure. Watch Andy Griffith. Oh, yeah. I, do. I still watch Andy Griffith. Yeah. 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 Every night, every weeknight. It was the 60s. It was really nice. Yeah. <laughs> and it is definitely an antidote in some ways. Oh, yeah. Um, well, this kind of goes hand in hand with that. What news sources do you rely upon um, on a regular basis? Are you talking to me? I think this it was just to oh, everybody. Yeah. So where are you getting your news? Where are you getting your current events? I uh, read the New York. I read on the New York Times and uh, the. Uh, Apple News, well, you know, it's a sort of an online gosh, gosh. combination. Mm -hmm. stuff and, uh, yeah. And we watch uh, MSNBC and yeah. CNN. And my wife is on Twitter. She goes, she's off into all these uh, conspiracy people. And uh, she, but she also tells me about developments before I hear about them on the more mainstream uh, uh, from my more mainstream sources. Yeah. Twitter so, sometimes does that. Yeah, yeah. For better or for worse. Yeah. Sometimes do that. Yeah. I, I read John? the Times 
I read the Economist every week. I think it's, it's the best source of news we can have. And I uh, and I watch public television. This is public radio. Yeah, NPR is the best source. Yeah, public radio. Oh, New yeah. York Times and public radio. And yeah. you know, I have taken my world and gone like this. Uh, me, me too. I can only take so much, but New York Times and public radio. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Ernie? What are you listening to, or where do or why? I, I read the New York Times on my phone first thing in the morning. I listen to a little NPR. My my motto is uh, up by six, pissed off by seven. <laughs> <laughs> It takes that long? <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm, really. I'm slow to burn, John. <laughs> do you guys follow the polls? Do you follow them? Do you trust them? Do you? No. I don't you just, know do you just have anything to do with the actual election and, and if that's, you know, a for real yeah. thing that we can trust anyway. So, right. You know that the polls matter. But that's me at my most negative. <laughs> well, I go on superstition. I think about what did I do when. The candidates that I wanted to win won. What did I do? What, what, what were my habits? And I'm trying to go back to those things because it worked, right? I mean, they won because I did those things, right? We ate pizza and we wore ball caps backwards, right? Yeah. Okay. Roy, somebody wants to know are there any virtual gigs coming up with the rock bottom remainders? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know of any. I mean, it's hard, you know. Our audiences tend to get together and sweat. So, we <laughs> Wait, so I, so you're yeah, that. that group? Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't think I knew that. Me, Tan, and uh, Steve. I am not. I am very unmusical, but I'm with an author's rock and roll band that uh, plays yeah. sixties and seven, fifties and sixties uh, songs, and I uh, introduced the band, and I sort of mess with. It. I sing titles sometimes, like <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 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 part of that too. Gloria, things like that. Gloria, <laughs> yeah, uh, right? Uh, That's great. And we, it, we and of, was yeah. Stephen King in that too? Or? Yeah, Stephen King's in it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really that is so great. Amy Tan, Amy yeah, Tan, Dave Barry, Dave yeah. Barry. Yeah. Is it true uh, that somebody could be you? So I I read one time. I don't know from whom, maybe Dave had written a paragraph or something about it, about who the band was and how it performed. And he said, everybody just picked up their instrument or sang or a part or whatever, and it was very loose. And he said, occasionally a rumor came across the stage that there was a chord change ready. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember yeah. who said it, but it had to be you or Dave Barry, I'm thinking, probably. That's great. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah. <sighs> and I'm the worst, I'm the least musical person in a in a highly unmusical band. <laughs> that, that has never stopped <laughs> anybody <laughs> with. <laughs> well, well, I'm, I'm an audible person, so I hear you singing every now and then on some of your books. That's kind of fun. You... Oh yeah, yeah. We were talking about Chad Atkins. Chad Atkins got me into BMI. So, if I, if really? I, yeah. There when you I, go. It's been you a long time. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm very limited, but uh, a couple of times I, I wrote a few songs that, that only I can sing. But I sang them on like the Tonight Show a couple of times and got royalties because because Chet got me into BMI. That's funny. Very smart. Smart to check guy. Uh, yep. Yeah. Say that again. Chet yeah. is a smart guy. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Hold on. I had an, actually you, I was reading on, in your bio about Andy McDowell. You wrote a song mm. that Andy McDowell sang in a movie. Right. Movie well, it, I didn't, it was not written as a song. It's a little poem about pie. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, of course. I can't remember how it goes, actually. But she said, somebody said it sort of to music, and she sang it in the movie. Uh, the movie in which John Travolta is a, is an angel. What's the name of it? Michael, I guess. Michael. Yeah. Michael. yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, that's great. Uh, me on my, nothing, I don't know, sweet, wet, salty, and dry. Nothing uh, tastes, yeah. Uh, uh, I forget how it goes. Yeah. But, uh, 
Uh, you, you should go check, uh, rent the movie. And, uh. Everybody rent Michael and watch it and listen to Andy McDowell sing. Nothing tastes sweet, wet, nothing tastes sweet, wet, salty, and dry all at once so well as pie. Mm. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Yeah, yeah. Are you all are you all into poetry? Who's your favorite poet? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> Can I just, I just want to do this because I, can I show a book? You can do whatever you want. Okay, so Ocean Vuong, who is a poet, but this is not a book of poetry. This is a book of fiction on earth. We're briefly gorgeous and it reads like poetry. I love that you asked this question. So I'm just saying this <clears throat> might be one of my favorite books of the past one to five years. What, wait, hold it up again. Hold it up closer. So people can but I want everybody else to answer the question, but this is just not when you said poets and I happen to be, I happen to be sitting here holding this book. Yeah. So what's the question? Who's your favorite, Who's your favorite poet? poet? Do what? You talked about writing a poem, a, 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 a sort of poem, and I just wondered who your favorite poets oh. are. Okay. I, I love, uh, I wish uh, song lyrics were as metrical as, as they used to be. Cole, Cole Porter. Oh. You know, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. I know you did an album, right? Um, yeah. The, the thing about being, uh, I get no kicks from champagne or this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. alcohol doesn't thrill me at all. Thrill at all. Yeah. I get no <laughs> kicks from airplanes. Uh, <laughs> uh, flying, flying high in the sky. Flying high yeah. up yeah. in the sky yeah. with some guy is my idea of nothing to do. You know, his masterpiece, or his, according to me, is the words to begin the begin. Oh, really? Huh. It's a it's a sixty four bar song. You sing it through one time, then it's done. Huh. And it's like a short story. It's a romance, and the ocean and the palm trees and all that stuff. And it's just extremely beautiful. Um, oh, I know. I got to yeah. listen to it again now. It's really, it's really something. Yeah, I would think from a writer's perspective, that would be an interesting study. I hadn't thought about that until now, but yeah. I hadn't thought about this either, but this was fun. I, one summer at the uh, jazz workshop, Lori asked me to, to put together a little curriculum for um, learning how to write lyrics for a song. Mm -hmm. And I had about six or seven pupils. And a lot of them had never written a song. And some of them had written all kinds of little things. It was very varied kind of thing. And I was trying to figure out what to do. And, and my theory is, this is just me, um, I think that people like Johnny Mercer and Harold Arlen and um, the woman that wrote with Jerome Kern um, and people like that are poets. It's not just song lyrics, they're poets. And if you read the, the words to um, Skylark, John Mercer. You could find it in the lit book, you know, in your dreams. But what I did was I printed out um, Johnny Mercer's lyric for um, Skylark. And then I printed out the um, poem, and I can't think of the guy's name now. <laughs> um, Shelley, maybe, that wrote uh, Ode to Sky. Ode to Sky, yeah. Yeah, yeah Shelley, yeah. I printed them side by side without telling who it was. And I asked them to tell me which was the poem and which was the song. Mm. Mm. And they answered all over the room, you know, just different. And, and it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. the, the same images and everything came up and they started out with that and they were like, well, <laughs> this is gonna be hard. I said, yes, it is. You can, if you make a song out of something, it's what makes a good song is that you remember the lyrics. 
anyway, it was a lesson learned that um, I think that that the, the major composers like like Mercer are every bit as important as the poets. Poets. Yeah. I like uh, when I'm sixty four. Oh yeah, isn't that wonderful? And it's 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 great light verse, you know. It's, yeah. It rhymes and it's, it's regular. Yeah. Uh, my favorite line is Vera, Chuck, and Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Name of their three children. But I better stop singing or uh, be in trouble. <laughs> you you may make some residual. You just you're yeah. 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 welcome to sing anytime. But make some for Paul McCartney. Yeah. Um, was that the pizza? Maybe. Mm. I'll leave it at the door. <laughs> they knocked on the door. Well, I have an early day tomorrow, so I'm going to check out, but I sure enjoyed this. Yeah. Well, Tom, I was going to talk yeah. to you about your book, but we'll have to do that another time. Okay. But I'll tell it to everyone. Right. Oh, you you show started? everybody John's book. This is it. Book. Healing Words. I had one question. Sure. Because uh, I know your politics, and I know you, I think, pretty good. And um, there were things in there that you, uh, people you took to task about certain things. And um, you have a way of not pissing anybody off. I mean, you just, you remain friends with everybody, even people that you ordinarily might disagree with on a, a large basis. And I just wondered how you kind of did that because it really, it worked out so that everybody was happy at the end. I, I don't think I've been quite as successful at that as you think I have, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean. Yeah. It was very graceful, the things you wrote about people that you disagreed with. And I thought that I, was. Yeah. You know, people, are, people are complex individuals and you can't, uh, you can't just paint everybody with, with one brush. It's a. Right. Yeah. I will tell you the first time I met you, somebody, uh, another doctor in town had referred you to me, and I didn't know who you were. And he said, you've got to go buy one of our albums. He told me one album was, and I think this was the days of records, actually, about 40 years mm -hmm. ago, 35 years ago. And I went and bought that, and I, was just, it was, I just fell in love immediately with, the, with your music and have been ever since. It's just been amazing to, to follow you and be a friend of yours. Well, it's been amazing to me, too, and my Raynaud's is it's under control. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you'd been around when my grandfather was up and running. He he had um, I found out later spondylitis. Oh, and back in 1920, they didn't know what to do with that. We couldn't do much with it in those days. Yeah, so he he was very crippled and um, had crutches and everything all the time. Mm -hmm. But oh, I said when the last time I saw you, I had a thing wrong with my thumb. It was. Because I'd played six shows at Birdland, yes, and you said you have you have insulted your tendon, <laughs> <laughs> and I told that to a drummer friend of mine, and he said he's a keeper. You better keep him. <laughs> we, we've known each other a long time now. We have, yeah, So give my best to Carol. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, you me. You just be safe, okay? Thank yes. Bye, right, John. We'll have to talk soon. Thanks, Roy. Good night, John. Um, Roy, actually, somebody wants to know, do you keep in touch with Bill Murray? Uh, sort of. We saw him in New Orleans uh, uh, a few months before, before the uh, pandemic. I haven't talked to him since, but he just sort of pops up every now and then. And uh, he's living mostly, I think, still in Charleston, South Carolina now. Uh, so, but I never have seen him there. But he comes to New Orleans. We, we spend half the year in New Orleans, and he comes to New Orleans. He was traveling with this, uh, with a couple of chamber musicians, in fact. And he, he was he was reciting, reading uh, poetry and things to go along with uh, classical music. Uh, huh. Yeah. So you never know where where he's going to pop up and what he's going to be doing. It's always something. He's got a new movie coming just out. Yeah, I understand with Scarlett Johansson again. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> That's cool. I used to see him more often when I was in New York, but him. Um, Ernie, somebody wants to know: Do you prefer coaching or teaching? <laughs> 
Uh, they're they're very similar things, actually. Uh, I I feel lucky to have been able to and to actually perform at them both. So can't say that there's a preference, although there's more um, there, there's more instant gratification in coaching. There's a scoreboard and there's a clock, and at the end of the day, you know whether you won or lost. So in that way, I guess I prefer coaching. That's a very precise answer. Very good. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, let's see here. Uh, did you say you have more questions for Roy? Hmm? Ernie, did you say? Oh, you asked me? I, I could ask Roy more questions than he wants to answer. No. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, like what? I'm aware. Well, let's see. Um, who the, who do you think, Roy, who is your favorite uh, Southern fiction author in the second half of the, from the, who wrote in the second half of the 20th century? Are, are a couple of favorites. I don't want to confine you. Well, I, 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 Flannery O'Connor, I guess. I had to just pick one. Uh, I guess Flannery O'Connor is sort of challenged now by uh, correctness, but... Uh, just because of some, uh, she used the N word in some letters, and mm. but I, she's a wonderful writer, I think, and uh, and Faulkner, great writer. Um, Udo Welty, I met Udo. Well, actually, when I was in, I had a high school English teacher who inspired me to be a writer, and uh, she got to know Flannery O'Connor, mm. uh, and uh, took me down to visit Flannery O'Connor when I was. Uh, I don't know, 21 or something, and uh, we, uh, it was great, we, I met her donkey, and I had, I used to have um, feathers from her, from one of her, uh, her peacocks, but my mother threw, threw them out for some reason. Aww. Some mothers throw out baseball cards, and some mothers throw out Flannery O'Connor's uh, <laughs> tail feathers. feathers. Yeah, she, she said, um, uh, she said she was uh, talking to somebody who mentioned a screw owl, and uh, she said, "What? Are you, what's a screw owl?" He said, "That's one of those owls that lands next to another bird on a on a branch and scrooches over and scrooches over and scrooches over to so he grabs the other bird." <laughs> and, uh, and what was the other thing she said? Uh, she said she, but she was really nice, and we had sherry and. Uh, and cookies, and her mother was hovering in the background. It was a year, just about one year before she died. She was, I edited a book of Southern humor, and uh, uh, she's, I think she's the funniest great uh, Southern writer. Southern. So, you know, like a good man is hard to find is, is all about somebody killing off a whole family one by one, but oh. still pretty, it's still uh, funny. Yeah, and uh, it's comical in a yeah. fierce sort of way. So I guess I would pick kind of Eudora Welty. I went to Eudora Welty's house one day. Wow, I always so, wanted to meet her. Yeah, she was real sweet, real nice. She, I wish uh, I was too shy to write her a letter. I, you know, probably could have had a little bit of a correspondence with her, but I thought, oh, she don't want to hear from me. And then next thing I knew, she had passed away. Mm. So, uh, I'm trying to remember a book of hers that I read early on. It was a big one. Um, had several um, big characters in it. Um, she had a girl that played the piano, and she played at the old um, movie houses before they had uh, music on the film. Mm. And she had this wonderful... <laughs> I know that she must have studied piano when she was little but she said the girl just gave it up after a while and she said I just saw my life going away with those damn yellow Schumer covers <laughs> those, those yellow what? Schumer covers the Schumer, oh, Schumer covers yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean that was so inside for her you know sure, sure. because I knew I've still got them in my music room I got a stack about like this with the yellow covers on them she wrote a story, wrote a story called Powerhouse. About, that was 
inspired by a Fats Waller concert. That's oh, that I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. Power out. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm a big Charles Portis fan. I love Charles Portis. Hmm. He died. I was friendly with him, in fact. Mm -hmm. True Grit and, and uh, Norwood. He, he's really funny. I tend to like good writers who are funny. In yeah. fact, I think all, all the best writers are funny. Mark Twain, Dickens. Yeah. Do, you, do you read George Saunders? Yeah, I read. Uh, I had didn't read that Lincoln book, but I read the stories. Yeah, early on. Good. Yeah, isn't yeah. it? And I think he's much inspired of Twain. He's he's mm. so so fun. he can say very difficult things in a, in a humorous way, and and gets away with it. Yeah, he's good. He's good. I have one more question for you, and then we'll call it a night. How about that? Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. This is this was geared actually towards the writers, but I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up a little bit. Um, the question was, uh, what haven't you written about that you would like to, but would like to write? But um, I'll I'll open it up to say, what type of things haven't you read that you want to read about? Uh, well, you know, there's so many that, like. Uh, politics, the politics stuff going on is so tire, tiresome, and so I mean, I feel like I ought to be writing about uh, Trump and, and the, you know the astonishing takeover of the country that he uh, seems to be pulling off or has been pulling off. But I'm just you know it's hard to come up with anything fresh to say about it. Yeah, I keep thinking I'll just you know. But he's hard to—he's hard to turn the corner on, you know. He's so shameless that you can't embarrass him. Right. Uh, and so I'm frustrated by not having written much about him, about uh, government these days. Well, maybe you'll have somebody new to write about soon. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah, it would. Yeah. What about? What are you? What do you? You know what I was saying about the difference. Difference between uh, the uh, the uh, one difference between the uh, Democratic ticket and the Republican ticket this time is that both uh, Biden and Harris have big smiles, have big natural, engaging smiles, and but neither Trump nor Pence does. Trump no. has all these weird little smug smiles, and Pence looks like he is, uh, you know, bit down on something. <laughs> Maybe a little constipated. Yeah, right. he's, um, he's trying to figure out how he can field the yeah. the woman he needs to talk to about politics That's and right. his wife, mother. Apparently, he can't be in the same room with a, another woman because something will happen to him. That's right. Which, mm. <laughs> which it probably wouldn't if the woman had any sense. Well, <laughs> no, there, 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 there is that. Those <laughs> things are like. Why can't he be in the same room with a politician that's a woman? Yeah. Uh, well, it, all that says about him is that he can't control himself. Yeah. You know, uh, I, bet, I bet whoever she is could control herself, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be in that room with, it's not it's like, so weird. My God, I'm in a room with Mike Pence. I can't. My clothes are just about to fall off me. Oh, my God. I don't think that would happen. So what, what do you, Ernie... What other things are you? We didn't really cover your. You have a collection coming out, and you've got a lot of things happening in your own literary world that you sh are and should be proud of. What is the Porch Award? Or wait, did I say that right? You did. Uh, there's a Nashville uh, Porch Writers uh, is a, a collective group of local writers and artists. Uh, and they give uh, uh, fiction and poetry awards away uh, once annually, and they're embarrassing me. I would rather move on to something I'd like to do that I haven't done yet. I would like to do similar to what Roy has done, to be able to, when he observed the 
Pittsburgh Steelers and kind of was embedded with them for a, for a year. To, to be around uh, a, a group, it could be a political group, it could be a, a, you know, a community organization of some sort, it could be a professional or a collegiate sports or a high school sports team. Mm-hmm. But just, just to watch the, uh, the embodiment of a team come from individuals and to note the separations and the, the uh, elasticities of the fabric that, that tie us all together and where the breaking points uh, may be in, in individuals uh, under, under stress or, and or competition. So <laughs> wow. be able to sit in somewhere and just, just watch life happen around me for a while. Hmm. That would be good for you. Yeah, can I hang out with you guys and just write about it uh, later? Sure. So let me in the house. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, well, congratulations on your porch award. That's incredible. Oh. I'm a fan of the porch and Katie and Susanna. And- uh, they're great folks. Yeah. Nice, nice people. Thanks. I'm glad that you know. Who? Yeah. What do you coach? I uh, coached, uh, I am formally coached uh, uh, women's uh, fast pitch softball. I, I was in, from high school to colleges and then eventually in, there's a professional league in America that I coached in for a while. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. That's great. He's a renaissance man. I'm yeah. so glad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. What league is that? The- the National Pro Fast Pitch, uh, Roy. Oh, oh, okay, softball. Affiliation with MLB. Yep. Great. I tried to play softball as a kid, and I was benched the whole season. I think, <laughs> I, cried. I think I cried a lot. I think they said no. There's no crying in softball. No <laughs> well, we have. I can't thank you all enough for doing this and just oh, yeah. hanging out with us tonight. You know, we started this just as a uh all, all of our our world just shut down like everybody else's and bg's concerts my concerts um just kind of you know halted hopefully temporarily and um so this is a nice way for people who are like us in quarantine and just wanted to have a chance to be distracted for an hour or two um online so thank you all for for doing this and joining us and um just a couple of quick little things we support live venues they were the first to close they'll be the last to open so um look at the description so you can see all the venues we're supporting and wear your mask model them for us if you would like and just thank you so much for doing this we appreciate thank you. it thank you i enjoyed it thank yeah. you yeah. 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 So I'll be you to meet out you. there, okay? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Right.
Thank you.